Prior to the 2016 elections, candidate Nana Akufuado made a bold proclamation about vision to transform the Ghanaian economy and bring jobs to the teaming youth of this country. The arrowhead of this vision was christened One District, One Factory. The sole purpose behind the 1D1F vision is to transform the Ghanaian economy from a Gorgesberg economy. That is, an economy which is dependent on the import of finished goods and the export of raw material, to one which is focused on manufacturing, value addition, and exports of processed goods. Since every district in the country is blessed with at least one dominant raw material, its best strategy is to pitch the industries to the various districts. Today, there are 232 1D1F projects with 76 operational, out of which 28 are new factories, 107 under construction, 36 commence construction, and 13 pipeline projects. In terms of numbers of participating countries, Africa has the potential to be the largest free trade area since the formation of the World Trade Organization, that is the WTO. Therefore, in March 17 and 18, 2018, African leaders held an extraordinary summit to sign the agreement establishing the African Continental Free Trade Area along with the Kigali Declaration and the Protocol to the Treaty, establishing the African Economic Community relating to the free movement of persons, right to residence and right to establishment. The objectives of the African Continental Free Trade Area are to create a single continental market for goods and services with free movement of business persons and investment, and thus pave the way for accelerating the establishment of the customs union. Today, through hard work and good negotiation approach of the Nana Adodanko Ekufadu and Baumia led administration, Ghana houses the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. What are the plans of this current administration to make a market of 1.2 billion people coupled with a GDP of 3 trillion count for us despite the devastating effects of the COVID-19. My name is Eko Vincent Tassefoa and I'm the parliamentary candidate for the good people of Old Tafo constituency and I'm your host for this show, Majority Caucus on Joy News. We are also live on all MPP social media platforms. Stay tuned, we will be right back. You are most welcome to Majority Caucus. My name is Vincent Okawasi for Jr. Today we have in the studios the Deputy Trade Minister, Honorable Robert Ahomka Lindsay. I remember him and uh, during his days with Coca-Cola. Um, but this afternoon, His Excellency the President of the Republic, Nana Adudam Kukufado, officially announced to the Ghanaian public the demise of the former president of the Republic of Ghana. His Excellency Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings. Under the Fourth Republic, 1992 to 2000, he was the president of this country. Now I want to read what His Excellency the President um, put out this afternoon uh, as part of um, the intention of officially announcing to the Ghanaian public and the world the demise of the former president. President Akufuado announces the death of former President Jerry John Rawlings. It is with great sadness that I announce to the nation that the first president of the Fourth Republic, His Excellency Jerry John Rawlings, has joined his ancestors. The tragic event, this tragic event occurred at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 12th November 2020, at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, where the former president was receiving treatment after a short illness. I convey the deep sympathies of government and the people of Ghana to his wife the former First Lady, Nana Kuneduajima Rawlings, the children and the family of the President in these difficult times. I have directed that all national flags should fly at half mast for the next seven days in all parts of the country and have declared seven days of national mourning from Friday, the 13th of November to Friday, 20th of November, in honor 
of the memory of former President Rawlings. The Vice President and I have suspended all our political campaigns for the same period. Government will work closely with the family of President Rawlings on the arrangement for a fitting state funeral for the late president. And will keep the nation informed accordingly. A great tree has fallen, and Ghana is poorer for his loss. May his soul rest in perfect peace in the bosom of the Almighty, and until the last day of the resurrection, when we shall meet again. Signed, Nana Ado Dankwa Ekufuado, the president of the Republic. Indeed, today is a sad day. We've lost a patriot. We've lost somebody who was the first gentleman of land in 1992 to 2000. Rawlings never dies. May his gentle soul rest in peace. Once again, today, across the country, the national youth organizer of the new patriotic party, lawyer Henry Nanabuache, also organized a program dubbed Boots on Ground. And so you could see the apparel that I'm wearing, uh, Boots on Ground, signifying that across the country, all youth organizers in the 275 constituencies moved around their various constituencies by making sure that they visit markets, they visit churches, they visit mosques, they visit everywhere, every nook and cranny in the constituency to sell the campaign, or if you like, to sell the messages of His Excellency Nana Adodankwa Kufa. The old Tafu constituency was not left out. And so uh, we are grateful to the National Youth Organizer, Henry Nana Boache, for um, such a human job, and we've been able to shake the whole constituency, uh, the whole country um, today. I will move to uh, Deputy Minister for Trade, Honorable Robert Amkalinti. Today we are going to deal with industrialization. Mm -hmm. The MPP's agenda as far as industrialization is concerned. Somewhere around 17th to 18th there about of August this year, Mm -hmm. His Excellency the President commissioned the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. Uh, how is Ghana going to benefit from the African Continental Free Trade Area? Well, thank you, uh, and good to see you again. A pleasure to be here on the Majority Caucus. Before I start, let me also add my small voice of condolences to the family and children of the late President right. Rawlings. To, so I think you gave a good introduction in explaining what it is the continental free trade is. Mm. And so let me give a little explanation for that. Then I want to go back right. to saying how we can take advantage of that. Right. So the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, Area Agreement, which starts on 1st of January 2021, will start first with goods, mm. later it would go into services. Mm. At its simplest, it's a market. There are 55 countries. In Africa, 54 of those countries have signed up the agreement to join. All and the 54? All 54. All Only 54. Eritrea have yet, but 30 have then ratified that in their country's law. Okay. So as we sit here today, 30 countries, January 1, 2021, will kickstart because they've incorporated the regulations of the continental free trade area in the laws of their country, like Ghana has done. Mm -hmm. It's a simple process. Think of a market of 30 countries, 1.2 billion, if you look at the total market, obviously 54 is 1.2 billion people, mm. a market with the size of over 3 trillion US dollars. Mm. That is the size of the cake mm. that everybody wants to be part of. But it's a little bit more than that. Take a step back. If you look at Europe, North America, and Asia, one of the things you find out is that the vast majority of their trade, their business they do, is within each other. Mm. So in Europe, over 55% of all the business that happens is within the European Union. Mm. Before they start thinking about Africa, US, and elsewhere. The US is, a little, is about the same, just under 40 odd percent. Asia is about the same, just over 50. When it comes to Africa, we have estimates of 1.5 to 1.7%. Mm. 15 to 17%. What that means is that we are actually losing the easiest fruits, which is our neighboring countries, to do business with. 
and going so far away to start looking for business. So the objective of this is to increase by 52% the amount of intra-Africa trade by 2023. Mm. Now, there's been a slight delay because of COVID, but that is the objective. The objective is that within 10 years for the goods side, 90% mm. of all the goods that are traded within those countries mm. is duty and quota free. Mm. So I can sit here in Ghana, mm. I can do my products and sell it duty and quota free to all the countries in Africa. Mm. I can make my t-shirts, I can make my clothes, I can make my products, pharmaceuticals, whatever it is I'm involved in, and market that. So that is the, the, that's the big, big prize. Mm. And the huge benefit is that as a result of the sterling work of our president, the secretariat is here in Ghana. That gives us unbelievable opportunity. Let me give you a snapshot before I actually go to the business side. This secretariat is going to have about 40 meetings, 4-0, every month, mm. with an average of over 100 people coming. Can you imagine? 100 people visiting Ghana, Accra, 40 times every month. What that would do for the taxi drivers, mm. the hoteliers, the eater, eateries. So you can see that the benefit, apart from all the benefits of having it there, this is just a small area. So now let me come to how we take advantage of that which directly links into the MPP's industrialization agenda. Mm. You see, Africa has always had an abundance of raw material. What we haven't had is an abundance of finished goods to, to, to trade with. Right. We have had an economy that has been designed around the, the preparation of raw materials that is exported to the north, east, or west, processed into goods, and then brought back into our country as import. Mm. The problem with that strategy is simple. It doesn't create wealth. Mm. It doesn't create enough jobs. And it means we only play a small part of the value chain of that particular business. Let's take cocoa. Mm. Between ourselves and Cote d'Ivoire, nearly 70% of all the beans in the world. Yet the two of us only play in about 12% of the total value chain. So can you imagine? You make all 70, 60, 70 percent of all the raw material base, but you only play in the 12 percent. Means that the biggest pie is outside your market. Right. And so, what we want to do is add value. Mm. That is the essence of His Excellency and MPP's strategy. We have realized that as a country, we have not come out of that neo-colonial style of sending raw material out and bringing in finished products, which means there's not enough jobs for the youth. Right which means we can't create enough jobs for the middle age or anybody else for that matter, or for the graduates. Right. It means that there is simply not enough money in Ghana for us to do what we want to. Because right. if you look at the example of the cocoa beans, the vast majority of the value is outside. Okay. And yet we started the process. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we're trying to do? The industrial strategy MPP is very important, but very simple. First of all, it must be joined together. It cannot be disjointed. You cannot have a series of disjointed activity because if you don't have that, you will not reach your target. So whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about education, whether we're talking about um, roads, infrastructure, it must all connect towards the industrial transformation of our country. So you build a road to a factory, not to nowhere. Mm. You build a hospital near where people are working, not when there's nobody there. So it's very important, and I think that is why when you see the MPP strategy and manifesto, it is all connected. It is connected. We need skilled people in Ghana to be able to do work. Mm. We need entrepreneurs to be able to build the companies of tomorrow. So if you look at it in pieces, you may miss the point of that. So that's the first point. It's joined. Right. Within the Ministry of Trade and Industry, you know, my minister, Honorable Alex Ramating, has been charged with the president to drive the industrial transformation agenda. Mm. It is actually in 10 parts, but we tend to focus on one, which is the 1D1F. Mm. It's an important part, but by itself, it will not succeed. So I quickly just want to mention what the 10 parts are. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go back into our 1D1F and that, because it's right. important because that all leads to ensuring that Ghana is ready right. Our businesses are ready to take advantage of it. As we speak, we're in fact going on a regional tour. His Excellency the President opened the forum here in Accra. 
We go on a regional tour because we have a national export development strategy. And we go into every we were in Kumasi. Uh, my colleagues are in Sunyani. I'm here, so I'm not there. Tomorrow we are in uh, um, uh, Techimain, etc. We go to all the regions to actually sit with the businesses to go through this. But the essence of it is the following. So one of the first ones, it is one district, one factory. And I'm going to leave that aside for a minute. The second one is what we call a national industrialization program. Let me explain that. We realized that many of our companies had survived the challenges of four years of doing so. Mm. Exchange rate going all over the place. Right. People telling them, don't buy your product. Right. And they needed help. If you bring in five new and five go out, net, you are zero. Right. So we must make sure that we take care of those companies. Mm. And so we had a stimulus package mm. designed along that to support them. Mm. The, second, the third one is strategic anchor industries. I'm going to come on to that. So while the one district, one factory provides opportunity at every rural area, the strategic anchor industries is designed to propel us. Mm. An example of that is the automobile industry. Right. I'll come on to that as well. The fourth one is what we call region one park. Mm. Special economic zones that are designed to encourage activities in the region. They can be generic. So for instance, in Tech Rider, there's one that's been done by Black Ivy which is looking at all various companies, or they can be specific. So you can have a park that focuses the automobile assembly mm. as a specific area. The fifth is the development of our SMEs. A core, something we forget is the following. The world mm. is run mm. by small and medium scale businesses. Right. They are the backbone. They are the creators of jobs, the creators of capital, the creators of ideas in the world. Mm. And we have a situation where SMEs needed support. Just as we speak, in the past two weeks, a new agency bill has been passed, the Ghana Enterprises Agency Bill, passed by Parliament, is going to his excellency, the President. A key part of that is a fund. We can talk about that as well. The sixth is what we call industrial subcontracting exchange. Let me explain what that is. You have a large company like Volkswagen coming. 20% of what they use in their vehicle is made by them. 80% is by SMEs. We want to show we have the structures in place to make sure that our SMEs become part of their value chain mm. so that we don't lose the opportunity. Huge of up to 3,000 different component parts go into a car. When I say component parts, think about the wheel caps made from aluminium. Somebody can do that now. The glass, uh, suddenly um, our glass factory, our Boso, a bosso glass it suddenly becomes attractive. Tires, bonsa tires. You can see how that builds in. That is the value chain of impact. Export development, mm. key, continental free trade. Mm. Because we realize that we cannot, on our own, grow the level we want to. We need to take advantage of markets outside the 30 million. Mm. 400 million ECOWAS, mm. 1.2 billion Africa, mm. four, 500 million US through African Growth and Opportunity Act. U uh, Europe and further afield. So export development, that is why we now have a national export development strategy. Eighth, domestic retail. We want to promote made in Ghana goods and promote people to consume made in Ghana goods. They say charity begins at home. Even if we only have 10 cities, spend it on a made in Ghana product. So you support your own. And also the physical infrastructure of our trade is important. The ninth is what we call a business regulatory reform. We live in a competitive world. In order for Volkswagen to come here and the other six, we needed to make sure that the regulation that manages that area has to be competitive. We're not trying to be all things to all men. We're not doing regulations across the board. We are focusing on those areas that we want to attract investment in. That is why you heard your Grand state that again, Ghana has the largest FDI in West Africa. That, you, now think of the size of the competition we're working with. Mm. Again, that means that we're doing something right to attract the capital we want. What is even more important, it is going into the areas we as a country want them to go into. Mm. Because not all investment is necessarily what you want. Mm. So that became, and then finally, on the 10th, what we call the public, permanent public-private dialogue. This government, His Excellency has made it clear, he is not going to do the business of business. His job is not to crowd out the private sector. We believe 
that the private sector is the engine of growth, not government. Government's role is to get some discipline, <laughs> fiscal and, and uh, monetary, provide the environment, and let our young men and women flourish in their ideas. And this is done through a permanent dialogue to make sure we're always on the same page. Mm. President has had meetings with all CEOs, mm. had a number of forums, there's an annual business forum that he deals with. The whole essence is to get a dialogue. So you can see how all that is interconnected. Even though we focused on 1D, 1F, and it is all interconnected. Without regulatory reform, you will not get the investment. Without strategy, you will not get entities engaging. Okay? Without ensuring you have an export market, if you produce, why are you going to sell it? Without having an SME development, you can't take advantage of the value chain. So you begin to see how that is all cor correlated, interrelated, and interdependent mm. to make sure that we get that business done. So that's an overall view. Mm, mm, mm. So the MPP's industrialization agenda, compared to others, and I'll be very honest, right. others is a mishmash of, I don't even know, it, has, it doesn't even have an ideology. Because it's an amalgamation of disparate, inter not even connected. The net impact of that will be like cooking a soup, where you're not sure whether you want to bunu bunu or katin kwang or aben kwang. You put everything in the damn thing to hope to get the soup, but then nobody's going to touch to eat the food <laughs> because you have, you you have overdone it. Yes, yes. There is no idea, and that is something that is so important because if you don't have an ideology and a focus of your industrial strategy. You will not get the right policies. If you are sick, or you go to a doctor, and they can't diagnose what is wrong with you, they give you something, it can kill you rather than actually help you. So you must understand what it is you are doing. And that becomes at the core. Well, uh, the, the president is about addressing the nation. Oh, okay. And I think that it's important, or it behooves on us, to, to make way for the president to address the nation. And so, uh, majority of course will return right after the president addressed the nation. inform you formally of the person of our former president. The family is led by Colonel Abuchi, Radis Jancha, the spokesperson, Mr. Blaguji, has been kindly invited to speak. Mr. Blaguji. His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nanado Dankwa Kufado, Honorable um, Chief of Staff, members of the, the government, as it has been said, a great tragedy has befallen us as a country and as a family. Some four weeks ago, we were here to inform the presidency of the death of our mother, our grandmother, our sister, and uh, the president, because of his special love for the ex-president, the former president, assisted us a lot in the burial of our mother. Uh, just some few weeks or some few days after the burial, the former president, Jerry John Rawlings, fell sick and was hospitalized. Of efforts were made. I know the president was in touch with his brother. Little did we know that the former president will leave us. So we've come here formally to inform the president and the entire government that this is what has happened. It is true. Jerry John Rollins is no more. And uh, uh, we deem it appropriate to, to come and inform you officially 
and uh, with me, the delegation is Kenai uh, Joshua Botri, Honorable Zanato Rollins, Mr. Michael Susudis, Santua Rollins, Yamina Rollins, and then the Celia Aholu, and then the Richard, Uncle Richard, <laughs> Bill Captain Richard Fodjo. So we have, we've come this evening to formally inform you of what has befallen us and has befallen the nation. Thank you very much. Chief of Staff, Kedla Butri, members of the Rollins family. First of all, I have to welcome you to the seat of the presidency of our country, the Jubilee House, and extend my deepest condolence and sympathies to the family. And now we have to call her his widow, her children, brothers, cousins, the entire family. I was given this information this morning when I arrived at the office. And um, I find it hard up to now to really incorporate, assimilate the information. This is a man of great vitality, and dynamism and energy. It's very difficult to conceive of him as a dead body lying in a morgue. Or... But then, I think one of the things that all of us have get to use, have got to get used to is that the Almighty has his own plans for each one of us. And improbable as some things may be, nevertheless they happen. It's a moment for reflection and for continuing to believe in his purpose, that he has a purpose for each one of us. And as it appears, former president's work here on earth has come to an end. He and I had a, a tempestuous relationship going over many, many years. But I believe that we came to see value in each other. That's how I put it by the end. I'm extremely disturbed and saddened by his passage. He's not an ordinary Ghanaian. He was the first president of our fourth republic, a man who held the supreme office in Ghana, and therefore his passage has to be a matter for the Ghanaian nation. I know the feeling of family on such an occasion, but I think that you would understand if I say that on the death of such a man, precedence has to be given to the state of Ghana. So, the chief of staff, their office, will be in touch with Colonel Abutri and the family, and Akone Dwajima Rawlins, for us to agree on how we proceed. 
time for funeral and all those things have to be agreed upon. But that the state has to pull out all the stops and make sure that he's given a most befitting and dignified exit. I'm determined to do that. I think his contribution to this country's history is there for all to see. And at the end, these had to leave. I think a grateful nation should show its appreciation of him in the manner in which it organizes his send off. So I'd like you to tell a former First Lady that that is a decision that I have taken. I'm going to give him a state funeral. And that between her and the Chief of Staff, whatever arrangements that have to be made will be made. Clearly, the wishes of the family cannot be ignored and they will not be ignored. But at the end of the day, the actual processes will be the processes of the Ghanaian nation. Just give him a befitting send-off. So I'm, um, appreciate very much your coming to inform me fully and formally of this development. When I was informed about it, I did through the chief of staff inform the family that, I, that having regard to who he was, I believe that the announcement of his death to the country should be the responsibility of the president. And it is on that basis that I had issued a statement announcing formally the death of President Rawlins. So that therefore prov provides us with the framework within which we can go forward. I am, uh, I know the Colonel very well from a long time ago. I know his attachment to his nephew and the beautiful children. How oh, they must be truly shattered by what has happened today. Extend my deepest condolence to you, to your sisters, and to your brother. There's not going to be an easy time for you these days ahead of us. But I'm sure that some of the strength in him is in you as well. So you'll find a way of being able to accommodate the, the, the development. I want to thank you once again for coming to give us this news in a formal manner. We're Ghanaians and we know how these things are done. But as I say, um, on the part of the state, no effort will be spared to make sure that the president is sent off like a president, a man who has held the highest office. For many people, the founder of the Fourth Republic, and we should honor him as such. His Excellency, we are thankful for your kind words and the plans that you have for the burial of the former President Jerry John Rollins. Our hearts are very heavy at this time. And uh, we just want to say thank you for all the promises. And we hope we'll give our brother fitting burial. Thank you. Some drink. Yeah. We've tra as tradition demands, we brought some drinks to formally uh, announce the event.
So I just did what I said. Thank you very much. The president may wish to have sort of A very sad day indeed. The family of His Excellency Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings visited the President of the Republic, Nadu Dango Kufado, at the Jubilee House to officially inform the President about the demise of the former President of the Republic. Indeed, he is not an ordinary Ghanaian, and His Excellency the President has promised that we are going to give him, or the state is going to give him, a befitting state burial. May his gentle soul continue to rest in perfect peace. We have a video that we want to show to the Ghanaian public, um, as far as one district, one factory is concerned. And uh, that is our next topic for discussion. In the next 18 minutes, that's what we are going to discuss. Uh, but I want the Ghanaian people to see this short video. Uh, within the next two, three, four, five minutes, we should be able to show the video. So when we return, Robert Ahom Kalinsi will do justice to the issue one district, one factory. You're yeah, most welcome. Yeah. So Robert, yes. uh, let the, me understand. The video is not right. okay. One district, one factory. Mm -hmm. How many jobs has it created for the Ghanaian people? And uh, because uh, we hear naysayers, that is the NDC always talking mm -hmm. about the fact that we have failed in this promise because in 2016, we mentioned that mm -hmm. every district mm -hmm. we are going to have a factory. Mm -hmm. Now, first question, have we been able to deliver on the 275 factories that we promised the people of Ghana? Secondly, how many jobs have we created, direct and indirect jobs, with respect to the one district, one factory uh, policy? Okay, so if you recollect, at the time we made this commitment, there were 216 districts. Now we're 275. Right. As we speak, and I will come on to and answer all the questions, right. we have 232 different 1D1F companies at various stages of completion. And let me explain what I mean to that. Right. Out of the 232, first of all, because I want to address, frankly, propaganda that has gone around, 28% of that 232 are existing companies that we've supported. 76% are brand new. Right. 28, 72% are brand new. 28% are existing companies. So let me spend a couple of seconds on that because it is one of the big issues that I actually, I have absolutely no issues and I'm unapologetic for us supporting existing companies. Let's be clear. Daco Farms. This was the largest chicken bait. Today, we import over 230 million chicken, some of it two years old from as far as Brazil. Daco Farms was the largest, that, that we used to call him Chicken King, Reverend Daco. The business had got to a stage where it was on his knees. Mm. So what did we do? We supported the business. We gave them an injection of capital, mm. and he's now coming back. Mm. We shouldn't apologize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not a, I'm not in the least bit perturbed. Mm -hmm. That's one of the 28%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example. Casa Preco, mm -hmm. which the president just commissioned. Mm -hmm. This business had a plant, new own factory in Accra. That in Tema. He built a brand new spanking business in Kumasi. We supported him. I'm not apologetic. We have too many businesses in Ghana that are too small. They are too small to be not even global players. Regional players, they can't even do it. So it is important that we support existing companies who need help. 
Because if we bring two new in and two go out and fall by the side, the net is zero. So let me just put that propaganda to a rest. We should not in any form or basis be apologetic in the fact that 28% of them are existing that we supported. We should support them. Go and ask those businesses or employees and those companies whether they think we should have left them alone. But the vast majority, 72% are new. Well, the NDC is saying that we went to pick up existing factories. You see, this is why they, that's why they don't, look, the truth of the matter, Echo, let's be but honest. But there's nothing wrong if a, a business is dying, a business is on its knees, it, it, and government creates the enabling environment for that business to be able to propel. They put so many business on its knees. Right. And we bring in a policy to revive industry. We should let them die and go and pick up new ones. Where's the logic in that? It makes no sense. You right. don't understand business. Right. In fact, if you leave them to die, Right. You are sending a message to the new ones that you we only interested in when you're brand shiny new uh, and, and the minute absolutely. you get in trouble, we're going to drop you like hot yes. potatoes absolutely. and go find new ones. Yes. That is not the way you do any business. Look, one of the biggest problems we have in Ghana is we have not had a legacy of businesses growing and growing and growing so that when the president, for instance, let me do for instance, right now on AFCFTA, if we do not create bigger businesses, we cannot take advantage of the 1.2 billion. We can hardly take advantage of the 30 million, let alone 1. 30 million Ghanaians, let alone 1.2. So let's not be apologetic about that. We supported them. We're happy to do that, and we'll count them as part of who we need to do. But as I said, so 232. I talked about a 28 percent of 72. 76 of these companies are finished, done, dusted. They are happily producing. They are confused of this world. I've mentioned Casa Preco. I've mentioned the others. Mm -hmm. These are companies that 76 of them have finished their, everything they're doing and they're going forward. The operational. Operational. Another 107 are under construction. Of course, you don't, anybody who has an iota of interest or understanding of industry mm. will tell you, you do not build a business overnight. Mm. You don't build a factory overnight. Mm. And these are companies, they are building their factories. In fact, the president has visited a number of them. And if the video had come, we could have shown some of them. I think we can, we can now go and show the video. Okay. Um, the next two, three minutes, um, I'll ask the producers to show. Uh, okay. The producer, can you show the Just video? Just to give us an idea. Yes. I, I saw Eva Pio in there. Yes. Eva Pio has been in existence for <laughs> God knows uh, what time. Yes. Why is it that we are including Eva Pio as part of our achievement in terms of one district, one factory? Let me explain something about fast-moving consumer goods. You know, I worked for Coca-Cola as VP for the Africa Group. Yes. You have one line that can make a number of products. You can add 20 more. Right. Each one of those is a new investment. Right. And you can build a whole new factory next to it. Right. Manufacturing's percentage of our GDP is less than 10%. Mm. We, our businesses are too small. We must encourage them to grow. It's less than 10, not even 20, 10%. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we have to realize, and this is something that is so critical to us, the existing companies, we must help them grow. Each time they're building a new line, is a capital investment. New jobs are created. We're not counting what they have done. Mm -hmm. They put a new line there, another 40 people mm -hmm. are done. We give them the tax incentive so that the duties on those equipment is zero, five-year corporate tax-free holiday, and on top of that, we subsidize the interest by 50%. Mm. That is a government that understands industry, how to grow them. But as I said, it's only 28%. 72% mm. are new because we know we need to add to it. Mm. We need to add to it. It's very, very important. You asked me a question about jobs. Let me answer that because I think this is something that, again, Yes, because you want to know the number of direct jobs that we've Thank created, you. the number of indirect jobs that the one district one factory has created and is supposed to be creating. Very good. So from the 76, you remember I said 232. Right. For the 76 alone, we have created 18,811 direct jobs. For the operational ones. That is 70, the 76. I'm not talking about the 232. I'll come on to the others later. For the operational ones. The ones are operational. So 76. today, we can go and count one, two, three, four, five. 18,811. 18,811. 800 direct. Direct job. Indirect, 120,520. 120,520. 120,520. 120, so let me use the Confia as an example. 
So, because you have to have lots of other people growing pineapple to feed into it, that's indirect jobs. Right. We don't do commender sugar. Where you build the factory and there's no raw material. Yeah. That is not our game. Yeah. Now, let me talk about the balance. There's going to be another 38,532 for the, apart from, do you remember I said 232.76? Mm -hmm. There's another 38,000 expected, direct. Mm -hmm. And another 247,000 indirect. But I can give you more. That is for the ones that we are yet to complete. The ones that are building, once they've completed it. Absolutely. But we know what they're going to do because every one of those we have a plan. Yes. But we don't finish there. Right. We've also managed to get local banks to provide 2.3 billion cities of funding to those businesses. Okay. On top of that, government of Ghana has given 200 million interest rate subsidies to those 76 businesses. Mm -mm. And we've given juicy exemptions of over 400 million Ghana cities. Every one of those businesses, we know what is happening. And every one of those businesses, we have to hold them like a newborn baby and help them make sure, because there is another fact that we forget. Mm. The vast majority of businesses fail. New businesses mm. fail within the first five years. Mm. Why do you think we pick five-year corporate tax-free holiday? Because we know that the vast majority failed, over 70%. This is an economic fact. So we want to give them the best chance possible to, to do what? To succeed. Mm -mm. But let's remember something. Some of these companies will not succeed. It's a fact. But this is a journey, a call. That is why we say four more to do more. Right. Not because we're just saying it for the sake of it. We have started on a journey that is unequivocal. It's clear, unambiguous. We have all the proof points for people to see. Mm. But industrialization is not achieved in four years. Right. We need to make sure we engage. Right. That I, is I, why we believe in the MPP industrialization agenda. We had in the studio <laughs> um, the Deputy Trade Minister, uh, Honorable Robert Ahomka uh, Lindsay. Um, just a simple takeaway. The one district, one factory has created about 18,000 direct jobs. Yes. It has also created over 120,000 indirect. indirect jobs. Now, it is, uh, it is anticipated that the yet to be completed factories is supposed to also create over 32,000 direct jobs mm -hmm. and also over 240,000 indirect jobs. What it means is that. The agenda of creating jobs for the Ghanaian people is on course. And that is why we are asking you to give His Excellency the President, Nana Adudan Kwekufadu, four more to do more for you. I'll see you next week. My name is Vincent Eko Asifo Jr. I am the parliamentary candidate for the good people of Otafo constituency. I'll see you next week, Thursday. Stay blessed.